My name is Karana Hattersley Drayton, and I live here in Fresno. Moved to Fresno in 1999, so I'm not a local. Uh, came from the Bay Area. I was born in San Francisco, raised up in Sacramento, and went to UC Berkeley forever. <coughs> and that's a really important part of my persona. Have an undergraduate degree in cultural anthropology, then went into the folklore program in, in, with a master's, and then spent three years in the PhD program in architecture history. And I like to stress that because I have a real Catholic approach to the environment and to buildings. It's not just you know the art history sort of perspective or even the architectural perspective. It's also about cultural issues and ethnicity and why things were built, et cetera, people. So. You know, as a kid, it's funny. I think that we're, we're sort of imprinted with what we might grow up to be when we're kids. I don't know if that's really true or not, but as a child, I loved old gravestone, old graveyards. I grew up in Sacramento and down the street was the old Sacramento Cemetery. And then I loved old buildings, old houses, you know, you go up in the gold rush country. And when I was a graduate, first entering the, the graduate program at Berkeley, James Deeds, archeologist, came to, to Berkeley and introduced this whole thing about material culture and that studying buildings and stuff there, there was this really rich context for it. It wasn't just, oh, I like this building. It, there was just this very interesting uh, process of understanding how people think through analyzing and looking and decoding and deconstructing, say, for example, buildings. So that was kind of my start. And then I went into the PhD program in architecture history. I was on the State Historical Resources Commission, but not as the architecture historian, but as a folklore, folk life specialist. And that kind of got my start, and I started to really work professionally in architecture history when I came here in 1999. I had been a consultant contract employee and I came to work for Caltrans as an architecture historian, worked for them for three years, and then the city opened up a position for historic preservation officer, project manager, and it was an opportunity to go from being reactive, you know, here comes the freeway, mm -hmm. oh, what's gonna be you know, affected to being proactive. You know, trying to save buildings, celebrate buildings, celebrate history, put things on the local register. So I worked for the city of Fresno for 15, close to 15 years. Um, my specialty is vernacular architecture. Um, you know, the sort of uh, buildings that reflect local aesthetics. In the past, vernacular really meant folk building, and that's how I started off. Um, one could say that Stevens and Zellner, for example, have created a vernacular here where they're Adobe, you know, stabilized Adobe brick garden offices. So um, vernacular architecture, I was on the board of the Vernacular Architecture Forum. When I was at the city, we sponsored, we hosted the national conference. Very interested in gendered spaces, very interested in, in outbuildings like tank houses and barns and things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, an architecture historian, it looks to, you know, you want to know the dates. Certainly that's the art historical perspective, but why something was built, how it was built, um, who built it, and, and ideally, you know, the, a nice spectrum of buildings hopefully will be preserved for the future, because that's our tie to the past. I live here in Fresno now, and I've done some work in Madeira, and, and I work for uh, an archaeologist, an arche archaeological firm, so I recently did some work up in Folsom, which was fun, Folsom, California. I've been up in San Joaquin, you know, a little further north. I've done some work in Merced. Um, but yeah, most of my work as an architecture historian was done once I moved here because I was sort of shifting perspectives. When I was up in the Bay Area, I did mostly special events, um, you know, cultural events at museums. Um, I'm trying to think. I was very interested in architecture, but I didn't, I, and I was going to school in architecture history but I wasn't really working as an architecture historian. It was when I moved here in 1999 that I really became full-time professional. We are sitting in the interior of the old Fresno Brewery. This is the former office for the brewery. The brewery extended to the south with several buildings, employed a thousand men, and this is where they came to get paid. And this is like stepping back in time. It's kind of, uh, it, it's really amazing, thanks to the owner, um, Pat Hahn. Um, this building was built in 1907, and it is kind of a mix of um, streetcar commercial and Romanesque revival. It's kind of 
a little on the outside of the Romanesque revival movement. So if you go outside and look at it, it's really an amazing building. There's a lot to it. If you were to sit and try to draw it, you'd, you'd find yourself, you know, really having to look hard. Um, it's brick. It's, you know, red brick masonry construction in an English bond um, versus a common bond or even Flemish bond, which is rarer. Uh, the detailing is beautiful. The Romanesque or the, the arched windows, the string courses, um, again, you know, the, the detailing, but then it's also kind of moving towards being, well, what they call streetcar commercial, the buildings that were brick, perhaps, that were built on streets, the streetcar would come by and there'd be a whole string of them. So it's a transitional building um, of sorts, probably designed by Eugene Matthewson, who uh, came here, gosh, when did he come here? 1899, I think. Um, and his first big commission was the second, not the first, Fresno City Hall, which has now been demolished. And that was kind of the start of neoclassicism in Fresno. Um, and then he built, he designed two or three buildings on the Fulton Mall. So in some ways he kind of gave the jump start to the, the introduction of what we call neoclassicism that came out of the Chicago World's Fair, 1893, you know, New York, all that, the, the buildings that have that tripartite scheme. So very important, but this is an earlier building for him, earlier design. There's a lot of very special things about Fresno that also apply to the you know, San Joaquin Valley. Um, I, I think we have to go back to the colony system. When I first came here and I started to do research, it was like, you know, all these colonies, these agricultural colonies, and it was like, what? You mean like Plymouth? Kind of, yeah. What happened is you had um, uh, entrepreneurs buying big tracts of land and subdividing them into 20 and 40 acre farms for farmers in the United States and definitely in, in Scandinavia to come here and find their place in the sun, lots of sun here. Um, but I think what's really important about the landscape, and then I'll get back to architecture, is that in putting in these colonies, they also very astutely, uh, to, to, to provide water, began to tap into and build canals. And so you have canals running through Fresno and through the outside area, and that's really neat, you know. And they're still used, they're still water, you know, there's water conveyance systems. And also landscape boulevards. So Kearney Boulevard, but most of these colonies, or many of them had landscape boulevards that were almost like a Baroque arrow that say, you know, led you to this particular track. And the people who planted these were not, you know, they, they were very astute. They planted um, uh, drought resistant varieties, you know, Washingtonian palms, oleanders, and, um, oops, what am I thinking of? Uh, eucalyptus. And, you know, sometimes you make a mistake, but for the most part, they were, they were very smart. And so I think a point that's important architecturally is that in my mind, Fresno was never a backwater town. And it was a railroad town, 1872, you know, uh, became chartered in 1885. But from the beginning, uh, other than somebody's little, you know, shack or something, the buildings, the commercial buildings were beautifully built, they were architect designed. The architects, many of them, were from MIT, Berkeley, even the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. You certainly see that as you go forward in time to the teens and 20s, our buildings downtown, the classic revival buildings along Fulton uh, Mall, Fulton Street, um, certainly are, are not unlike buildings in San Francisco or New York, but very definitely influences from, from other places. The other things that are really important that are different about Fresno uh, is the um, adobe tradition here. Um, because, you know, there were lumber mills, but adobe, building with earth, um, was environmentally uh, sound, inexpensive, and could do it right there, right? Uh, and so you even have buildings as beautiful as Kearney Mansion, 1903 built out of adobe. There were a lot of adobes built in Old Fig, and they were built by Mexican itinerant craftsmen, but designed often by architects, or maybe by the, the home builder. And in this sort of early California style, there's this kind of nostalgic thing going on. And then the Herndon Canal through Old Fig flooded in 1938, 
And so these buildings literally melted. So that put into business Hans Sump and his stabilized adobe bricks, you know, which had emulsifier in them. So, and, and so people started to rebuild with adobe, with these stabilized adobe bricks. And in the 60s and even into the 70s, you get these amazing garden offices along Shaw that were designed by Robert Stevens and then a little bit later, Robert Stevens and Gene Zelmer. And that is a really, really cool part of our local architectural history and landscape history. Uh, Stevens came out of USC and ultimately, I think, got a fellowship, is, is that what you call it, AIA, F-A-I-A, for his garden offices. So they're really a Fresno thing. So a lot of really great stuff about this area. For example, in the Security Pacific Bank building downtown, off the top of my head, I think that's 1923, I think. Um, anyway, I remember going through it years and years ago, and uh, the owner at that time handed me a piece of marble that was too small, it didn't come off the wall, and you know, couldn't have been you know, really reused. And I still have that. It was Tennessee Walnut. I think that was Tennessee Walnut marble. It's from a, it's from a quarry in Tennessee that's closed. So the point is that you have materials as well as, say, for example, Italian craftsmen doing these buildings for the architects, Julia Morgan, you know, you worked a lot with Italian craftsmen. But you're right, the craftsmanship, we would pay a zillion trillion dollars, you know what I mean? But at the same time, there are, you know, some new technologies. Um, they've done this, for example, with Frank Lloyd Wright's, um, you know, he, he used bricks that had <laughs> fallen apart you know, CMUs and sort of new synthetic materials that look just like. And if they look just like and they're going to hold up, I say bravo. I'd be, I'm real concerned about foam, using foam, I got to say. There's nothing like wood, and I will throw my body in front of any bulldozer that tries to take down, a, you know, take out um, wood sash windows, um, you know, and put in vinyl or whatever. So, yeah, I think the original materials are really have a quality, but yeah, I'm sure there are synthetic materials that can be used. You know, I think the thing that's really important about historic buildings is they tie us to the past, and that's kind of cool, but they are an economic uh, generator, too. Uh, old buildings that are useful are great startups for you know, new businesses because you know, maybe the rent's cheaper or something like that, but also um, because of heritage tourism. I mean, you know, when you're heritage, people who go looking at historic sites spend more money than someone going to say, you know, sports events. They spend much more money, three times as much, something like that. And so, you know, the, the, the Fresno Water Tower is one of its kind, whereas shopping centers, you know, you've got them, zillions of them all over the United States. So <clears throat> history and, and, and historic buildings aren't just neat and cool and, you know, good for education and for our children, but they're also really important for an economic stability and for kind of moving forward in, in terms of you know, establishing an economic base.